killers and the spoilers. And that's where the U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. The first man they looked for and the last man they wanted to see. I'm that man, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. Yeah, I was a disc jockey at uh, KFXM in, uh, in San Bernardino. I was a disc jockey at KGFJ. Uh, here in, in uh, Los Angeles, I played and loved jazz, and so I, I did a lot of you know playing of jazz. And, and as a youngster in my 20s, having meeting and doing dance band remotes at uh, Camp MB in San Diego and uh, here in L.A., meeting Tommy Dorsey, Benny Goodman, and Artie Shaw, and, and you know Jack Teagard, Louis Armstrong, my God, having friendships with, with, with a lot of these people. We offer you escape. Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Jeff Chandler in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Fibber McGee and Molly. You know, they were vaudeville, for, and then, of course, Chicago radio yep. in the 30s, and uh, graduated to, to network radio, and, and when you're a kid growing up and you're listening to them, and when you finally get to meet them, and you get to be on, on Fibber McGee and Molly, uh, you know, you've arrived in heaven. It just brought back so many memories, but the, but the challenge of, of, of trying to keep the laugh pattern going, and... and and, and the excitement was so challenging and so much fun that it was a ball. NBC has brought you the Fibber, McGee, and Molly program transcribed with Joe Granby as Mr. Hull, Bob Bruce as the lieutenant, and Herb Ellis as the workman. The Halls of Ivy, starring Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Coleman. <laughs> Good evening, this is Ronald Coleman, Benita Coleman, inviting you to join us again on the campus of Ivy College as the guests of our Matt sponsors. Matt Wolf was the director, and uh, yeah, it was, it was fun to work. Well, Ronald Coleman was a giant, and uh, not because he was Hollywood, but because he was uh, a nice human being, but also a schooled actor, yes. uh, you know, not a movie star. He was an well, actor. I'll take the exam. I didn't think it was going to raise all this fuss. And I'll apologize to old Easy Maxie. Uh, I mean, Professor Maxwell. <laughs> Thank you, Lewis. Leslie, I, I was sure you would. Thank very much, Mr. Halsbracker. That will be all. Now, <clears throat> now then, Archie. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. That was, that was so much fun to work with Sidney Greenstreet. Sidney must have really enjoyed doing radio because he did quite a bit of it in, in addition to all of his movie work. Yes, yes he did. Yeah. And do you remember how he, how it was that he got the role? I mean, because he's... Uh, of Nero Wolf because I mean he was more mostly thought of as a as a movie actor, but he must have auditioned or maybe somebody asked him to I think, I audition. Think he, he was bellicose. He had this great laugh. He had you know he had the big the big belly, the big body, and uh, he was a guy that could do me a favor, Archie. Go take care of it. It was just <laughs> it was a ball to work with because he was also a consummate artist. He was a a Broadway actor and you know came from the theater and. And his movies... Lux presents Hollywood. Lee 
Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Ray Milland and Colleen Townsend in It Happens Every Spring. You did a lot of gun smokes. Gun smoke. A lot of gun smokes. Yes. Now, everybody in Hollywood, according to Bill Conrad, auditioned for the role. Did you did you audition for any of the major roles, or did you, or did you basically do the? I know you did the character roles, but I, I mean, did the character. No, I didn't audition for Gunsmoke. Uh, no, I didn't. Mm -hmm. This is your FBI. This is your FBI. Jerry Devine. Chuck. Jerry Devine, mm -hmm. one of the great, great directors, one of the great, great this people. This is your FBI. The official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak for Hire. Sure, I'm Pat Novak for Hire. Jack left, I think, in either the early or late 47 or early 48, because I left in 48. And uh, after he left, Ben Morris, uh, another announcer at ABC, KGO, uh, took, his, it took his spot. It was created by Richard L. Breen. Mm -hmm. The, the metaphors and, and the words that he wrote and the wild, wild stories that he wrote were so intriguing to Hollywood. How many of the Pat Novak for Hire shows did you do? I think I probably did all of them. Heard on tonight's presentation were Ben Morris as Novak, John Galbraith as Inspector Hellman, Jack Lewis as Jocko, and Mary Milford as Blanche, with Herb Ellis, Jerry Zinneman, Kurt Martell, Jack and Webb Dick Jack Webb was Eller. on a movie called He Walks by Night. I don't know if you I know the name. Remember, yeah. uh, this was a, uh, a a character. They called him the uh, the Red Light Bandit. Right. And uh, and Jack had mm -hmm. a small part, but he met two of the policemen that were the technical advisors on He Walks by Night, and they suggested to him that he do a radio show uh, about that. And coincidentally. A year before that, I had written a show called Joe Friday, Room 5. It was a private eye. And I had just doodled a couple of notices and little notes and half of a script. And, uh, and that's how Dragnet was born. Trouble Monday night. Yeah, sounds like it might be the same gang, too. This kid is sure moving fast. Yeah, did you leave a note for Simmons? Mm-hmm. All set. What is it this time? Movie theater on West Fremont, small neighborhood house. Mm-hmm. They had a crowd of 15 or 20 kids in there today, mixed group, boys and girls. For no reason at all, they started to tear the place up. They do much damage? Well, we can see when we get there. They told me on the phone, theater manager tried to quiet the kids down. Half a dozen boys piled all over them. One of them pulled a knife. They tore up a couple of seats, moved out into the lobby, smashed mirrors, lamps, beat up one of the ushers. The lousy little punks that give a right arm to know how this thing got started. We never had much trouble from the kids in that neighborhood out there, Joe. Not until this last month. They seemed to be going crazy. Sorry to loss up your weekend. Oh, that's all right, Lavelle. Good-looking blonde invites me to spend three days on her daddy's yacht. I get those offers all the time. Good. And you won't miss it this time. The DA's got a job for you. Let's have it. I gotta go home and unpack. This unsigned letter came to the office. I'll save you the time. 
Claims that pushers are operating out of a hash house uptown. Yeah? Where? Columbus Avenue, the 140 grill. The letter also says the woman who owns the place is clean. She's got to play ball or she winds up dead. I take it she's the one who rode in. Could be. We don't know. That's why we want you to run it down. What are they pushing? Schmack. No word on how they pass it. Maybe this letter's from a crank. The whole deal might be a phony. If I were you, I'd hope it falls that way. You'll get all your toys back. What's that mean? The blonde, the yacht, and the weekend. Wonderful opportunity to play uh, a hippie uh, poet, kind of jazzy guy called Wilbur on Peter Gunn television. Hi, Larry and John Gassman here. Herb Ellis was a friend, uh, more than just an acquaintance that we learned about and knew about because he came to speak at a Spurdvac convention. He came to a meeting with Herb Vigran in 1983 and directed our first recreation in 1991, which was the case book of Gregory Hood. But he was just maybe one of the nicest people you ever would have met. Those of you who met him at reps and at Spurdvac conventions and other conventions around the country know exactly what we're talking about. I remember in 1994, I picked up a stereo along with John, herniated a disc in my neck. And later found out that it was on rollers. Yep. Uh, but we went, I went to the hospital the day of the Northridge quake, which was an interesting way to begin the day. And Herb Ellis found out about it and came to the hospital to see me. I remember most of it, not all of it. But it was a great chat, at least the parts I remember. Later, when I got married to Melinda in 2002, Herb came to the wedding. And, uh, he and Herb Sil and Sylvia. And both. Sylvia yeah. both mm -hmm. came to the wedding. And and I'll always remember that they, he, he was one of these people who would just call on the spur of the moment to say, hey, how you doing? I really uh, enjoyed the convention or whatever it might have been. We always called each other on our birthdays. Yep. Uh, yeah. every, every year. And later that it evolved into having Herb on the, uh, on the radio USA show, show yeah. at, on the fr closest Friday to his birthday. I think from 2012 on, or 2013 on, we had him on to talk on his birthday about Dragnet, about other shows he had done, just to see what was going on and how his birthday was spent. And he even we even talked about stuff we'd never talked about in front of spurred back audiences with regard to his very early radio career. I remember that one year specifically. He, he said, nobody's ever asked me about Cleveland. Yeah, or, or, or being in a big band mm -hmm. an, uh, announcer etc or player he could play as well and for those of you who are wondering yes he d did know the other herb ellis who their, was a guitar player their mail got mixed up on yes. many occasions and paychecks from time to time he was a delightful man a very genuine man and we will definitely miss him <laughs> 